Welcome to the Crazy Wisdom Podcast. My guest today is Cody Hergenroder. He is a multimodal creator, wears a lot of hats, and cares deeply about product. Welcome to the show. Hi, guys. Good to be here. Mm. Uh, what ha- What is the thing that's captured your interest in the last week? Yeah. Um, I mean, lately I've been thinking a lot about like uh, just product management, being a product manager. I mean, yeah, it sounds super boring, but <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's, that's kind of the career direction that I'm intending to go in and uh, found a lot of like very personal resonance with it kind of related to, uh, we had a previous conversation about my, my major symbolic systems. And so it's just kind of the natural kind of next step from that, I feel like. Interesting. What is the relationship between product management and symbolic systems? Yeah. Um, well, symbolic systems is kind of like for, for like a certain kind of generalist. You know, mm-hmm. I mean, we, we we talked a bit about it. There's there's so many ways to describe symbolic systems, um, but a lot of symbolic systems majors end up becoming product managers because there's kind of an overlap. Like it's, I think one way I've conceived of being a product manager, it's kind of like the circulatory system for uh-huh. you know the the vessel of the company, uh-huh. and so uh-huh. everyone else is like, you know, it's like you got the muscles and they're they're trying really hard. Or you got you got the brain, and they're all like doing their own thing but like you know who's going to kind of like be the interplay between all of them like the yin and uh so i see the product manager is kind of like sacred in that kind of a way yeah it's like uh at my previous role i was the director of knowledge management and i had a conversation with somebody who was like the chief head coach of the organization and i can't remember whether he was talking about the coaching aspect of the organization or knowledge management but he described one of them as the connective tissue of the organization uh, and the connective tissue in general in our bodies, the connective tissue is really interesting. Uh, I've been a yoga teacher and massage th- therapist for various times, and I've learned a lot about the anatomy of connective tissue. And connective tissue is fascinating because it's made up, it's a structural protein, and it's like cells are basically pooping out this fibrotic tissue which is totally structural in nature that if, if without it, we would collapse into a puddle, uh, but is, is, is inorganic, but is somehow created by organic matter. Um, and it's, it, it, but it, it weaves together, together everything and our, our entire body is one body. It's not multiple bodies. It's one unit. Um, and, and because of that, like a lot of doctors and medical scientists and scientists in general try to isolate things and they try to, separate things and cut things and and try to find out what's the thing at the at the very bottom layer and at some point that's like an illusion cuz everything is connected there, there there's no point anywhere where we can say that part is disconnected from the entire universe or our body or whatever um and so the same thing happens in a company uh there is a connective tissue of the company and product manager as the connective tissue of the company is a very interesting idea. I was just having a uh, in a podcast interview with my dad uh, yesterday, uh, and we were talking about Apple and Steve Jobs' really interesting insight into the personal computer as a product. Um, and I believe Apple started the product management. Actually, do you know the history of a product management? Do you know how that how that started? I I am actually not sure. I if I recall, it started sometime around like 1970. Oh, okay. And I, I could be totally wrong about that. I'm not sure. Interesting. Um, I'm gonna look it up on uh, ChatGPT right now. Um, so uh, so so you're doing product management right now. Um, and it's for IdeaFlow. And IdeaFlow is a very interesting app focused on note taking. Um. And what are the key elements of a product for note taking? Well, <clears throat> you want it to be able to take notes, <laughs> and you want it to be able to keep your information and not lose it. Yes, that's that's really important. Um, these days, sync is really important so that you have access to your notes everywhere you go, kind of between devices. Um, kind of some kind of cloud sync system. Um, and you want it to be able to hold 
the right the right kind of information mm. or the right have the right information structure in place mm. and so with notion you know a lot of the times that's that's some a certain kind of database you know for something that you want to keep track of uh, or for other people it's like a bulleted list system mm -hmm. um Hmm. Um, yeah. And uh, so very interesting with note taking specifically, there is an element of it's it's so fundamental to our civilization. Like people just talk about note taking as if it's this thing that's like, oh, it's just another app, right? Like taking notes, it's just another app. But in reality, it's actually really fundamental to our civilization. There were two primary ways that we started using the written word one accounting and then two uh writing well sorry uh it was accounting and art those were likely the two main ways that human beings started to uh put things down on paper right and that accounting very boring but that's what it was for a long time like people would train as literary like scribes uh and to go in and account for how much grain had been borrowed to what guy you know 5 years ago and how many seeds they would have to give us the next year and such uh and then also religious documents as well um and then political kind of uh political authority uh those types of docs doc documents and everything like that and so note taking seeming like this very subtle thing uh is actually really important and so the idea of building a note taking app is actually quite ambitious. Would you agree? Would you disagree? Wow. <clears throat> I mean, there's a lot there. Yeah. Um, built in note taking the app is quite ambitious. I mean, yeah, I mean, you, you're, kind of, you're kind of getting at some questions that like we were asking ourselves. Like, I think there's a lot to a note taking app that most people don't realize. Mm -hmm. There's like an element to it where you know, you can just, I don't know, there, there's an element to it where you're able to just, I don't know, open up text edit on a Mac or, you know, notepad on, yes. on Windows. And like, yes. in a way, you know, that can, that can, that can meet a kind of a need. But then, you know, if you're building a product, you have to be asking about like, why are people taking notes? And that is like a fucked up question. <laughs> it's, it's, it, it pulls on a lot of threads. Um, and you know, you can kind of answer that in some abstract hand wavy ways. Yes. Um, but why do people take notes? notes? Why do people take notes? Yeah. That's a good, it's a good question. I can I can take a stab at it. Basically, why do people take notes? Well, I'm taking notes right now. I, I just started my, uh, uh, I got a moleskin note. Uh, no, usually I take notes on the computer, but I'm going to take notes uh, on paper now because now I got the AI in the background. After we record, I'll have the transcript. And so I no longer need to write down the important details. Um, and so now I'm just going to use note taking as a way to uh, uh, distract myself uh, from r whatever, you know, uh, and it, like the ADD thing, you know, the fidget fidget spinner. It's like, I don't need a fidget yeah. spinner, I'll just take notes, right? So, so, so like there's the, why do people take notes? Well, that's one random quirky reason that maybe not many other people have, but, um, uh, but then there's also, why do people take notes? Well, somebody tells me this really important piece of information, like an app. I just found one yesterday called Redcom. If you guys want to leave comments on Reddit in an automated way, uh, Redcom is the, is the way you do it. So he sent me that and I was like, oh, I got to take that note. So I put my note into my WhatsApp um, channel with just myself uh, and then saved it for later, basically. Uh, and then I put it into my space repetition system. And this gets into actually into great territory too, because we, we can talk about um, first brain versus second brain technique. Are you, are you familiar with that distinction? I, I've heard of the distinction, uh, but I'm wondering if you could clarify. Sure. Uh, so basically first brain means our brain. Uh, memory are are before the written word. What did humans use to take notes? Uh, they took their uh, brain uh, as a note, so they would memorize all these facts. And the way that they would memorize the facts were actually through a process called um, 
uh, what is it? It's, uh, I forget the name of the process, but, um, it's you, you visualize things, you visualize your home, your childhood home, and then you place the various things that you want to remember in your visual home. Do you remember what, it, what it's called? Yeah. That's like a memory palace. I think. Yeah. Memory palace, memory palace. Exactly. So that's a first brain technique, but anything relying on the memory is a first brain technique. Anything relying on the written word is a second brain technique. Um, and I added a new element that I believe I added, I'm not sure if I was the first one to think about it, but AI is the third brain. Um, and so AI is like a whole other alien form of intelligence that comes in and can help us both with the first brain techniques and the second brain techniques. Um, so so, the, so to go back to that question, why people take notes, we've got the first brain, we've got the second brain, we've got the third brain. And why do people take notes fits more into that second brain thing but it's also about memory as well. What's your relationship to memory? Do, did you guys study memory in, in symbolic systems or um, what's your take on memory, uh, the importance of memory? <clears throat> That's interesting. I mean, I, I would reply a little bit to what you're saying about the first versus second brain distinction. I kind of feel like, um, you know, like like other people can also be our second brains. We, mm -hmm. we store a lot of, we store way more information than we realize in, in other people. So like after having this conversation with you, there will always be some part of myself that I can only access through having further conversations with you. And it's interesting, you know, because we, 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 we generate it together. Um, and, you know, in that way, uh, part of your second brain is also stored in me because there are certain ideas and pathways that get activated Ooh. in a particular pattern based off of just the way that we interact and vibe. That's a really good point because it's, it, it makes me rethink my addition of the third brain uh, which is that the third brain has always been distributed cognition, that it's the, 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 the second brain is the note taking, but the third brain is other people's brains. Um, and it actually goes right into AI because AI LLMs are trained directly on the internet, which is a giant note taking device for the entire species, uh, a, like a networked brain. What's your take on that? Do you do you agree that that's what the internet is, or do you disagree? Yeah, I mean, I love that. Um, it's a network brain that's like slowly coming alive as a result of LLMs. Like, so I mean, you, you had the birth of the internet from uh, Tim Berners Lee and uh -huh. whoever at UCLA and whatnot, um, huh. crafting like this this network system of of computers where you could, you know, feasibly access information you know in different places you just had like this this larger repository of information yes. and, um and uh, uh http where all of a sudden there was like this there was all of a sudden this this structure to accessing information so it's almost like mm. i don't know that's 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 a major Ooh. advancement um and you know then you had kind of google which is built on http and and that allows you to kind of you know, so there's this emergence of having a conversation kind of with with the internet, and um, you know, first you have like uh, you know, just whatever whatever pages you're on, but then with Google and search indexing, you're able to kind of put in these search queries and access you know some some arbitrary you know list of of pages that are like relevant to you, and then LLMs becoming the natural next step of like having a conversation with this distributed knowledge network, um, you know, this time even more in natural language, and it's and it's and it's somehow feels like there's a human on the other end a lot of the time who's like parsing this because it's just, it's so perfect. Um, and there's a lot of flaws with it, but it's just, it's so good. It's so far past the uncanny valley. <laughs> yeah. And it's just like, God damn, like who, whose brain is thinking of this right now and, and, you know, understands what I'm wanting from this query. What do you think is going to be the impact on it? Cause it's, it's, we're so in the middle of it right now. Uh, like w what is the impact going to be like? with this scary sort of brain that most, I would agree with you that uh, if you did actually say this, that uh, uh, this is my own thought. Um, people are afraid of it, very afraid of LLMs. I've been talking to a lot of people and even programmers, I would say 90% of them aren't using AI, not necessarily for fear. Uh, I think a lot of it's habit as well. Um, uh, uh, would you like, what do you think about this? Cause the fact that I believe ChatGPT was the fastest growing product in history, got to 200 million users extremely quickly, and then has now plateaued so that there isn't actually that much growth 
that they're actually experiencing anymore. It's like mm. the amount of people who use AI seems to be at about 200 million people uh, in out of <laughs> 7 billion people, um, which is really interesting. Uh, I've been actually spent this morning talking. I'm considering Argentina to be somewhat of a laboratory for the business that I'm starting. Um, my Most of my customers are going to be in the United States because uh, easier to do business, uh, all these different things. But down here in Argentina, I'm considering it to be a sort of laboratory where I work with companies down here, very traditional old school companies to try to enable AI to, into them. And so I, yeah. had a, I had a conversation with somebody about that today and he runs a logistics company. Um, and the AI, it's like he had, he was a very smart guy. He got it immediately, but he was like inside of my trucking company, it's going to be extremely hard, uh, to just convince people that this is worthwhile to look at, uh, or to interact with particularly. And there's just so much hype right now about how AI is going to turn into either a God or a demon. Um, and set, like, like. I don't believe it's going to do either of those things, although there will be a lot of changes. Uh, but a lot of people are, are a lot of afraid. Do you do you feel afraid at all? Or are you excited? Like, what's your emotional resonance with with AI? A couple of different threads there. The yeah. first that I'm thinking of is, you know, if you have like employees in your company who are resistant to AI, you could just tell them that it's not AI. You could just say this is someone in a call center yeah. using, you know, auto suggestive technology. I don't know. It's it's it'll get you there. Yes. Interesting. That's a good idea. Yeah. Uh, you know, just playing with people's perception. I mean, it, it passes the Turing test a lot of the times. So. Yeah, I mean, we're talking about the ultimate, you know, the impact of artificial intelligence on the Internet at large, on, on society at large. Uh, you know, and, and people's sentiment to that as part of like this, this loop, you know, that can right now people's sentiment can kind of guide AI, you know, to progress faster or slower, mm -hmm. you know, or, or, or maybe, you know, we actually don't have any control because it's in the control of, you know, a handful of powerful people who already have their interests figured out. Um, so I'm just thinking about the loop between, I mean, earlier you are saying the reason that we started note-taking was accounting and art. And, and art is itself a very powerful transcendental force. I've been yes. like playing around with that, like increasingly just thinking about fashion and like what, how art affects people as kind of this invisible string. I don't know, like everything you see around you is designed like, yeah, art is everywhere. The microwave I'm looking at, that microwave is also a piece of art. It may be a very poor form of piece of art, but somebody could turn a microwave into a piece of art and sell it. You know, it's almost like it's one of those things like where's the boundary between art and not art? You yes. have things where that really their form matches their function completely. And you have oh. things where their form is really, you know, just for for um, let's see, function and aesthetics. So if the form just matches aesthetics but i would say you know even even something's form being purely functional is is a form of art um <laughs> i don't know i mean like nature for example everything evolved purely functionally oh and yet it's it, they had all these emergent aesthetics and there's the aesthetic of being functional as well mm. and um but i actually didn't want to talk about art right now i uh you know in terms of the the other side um the side of note taking for economic reasons um there's this so there's this inextricable tie between like our knowledge management and uh you know capitalism and yes. and you know this the system of money that seems yeah, so, so deeply tied into us and um yeah i, I think that th this system of money the way that we have economics the way that economics guides what we seek to do in life it guides you know like what we spend most of our hours on and what yes. we think about you know for a lot of our time uh i think that same force is going to be is you know guiding the creation of artificial intelligence and uh that's kind of like that's that's kind of the it's coming from economics it's also coming from academic institutions which are ultimately you know run as a result of of economic funding or you know uh, funding as a result of our economic system mm. and um 
yeah, it's 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 going to be it's an interesting feedback loop. Um, I don't know. I, I think I think we we seed artificial intelligence with our thoughts, a lot of which is kind of like meaningless BS, worried about useless things. Um, but I, I I can't at the end of the day I can't help but shake uh, an ultimate optimism and bullishness hmm. because of the idea of what advanced intelligence looks and feels like to me and, and what I feel like I, I just, I, I have certain like teleological feelings about humanity, like certain, certain attractors at the end of all of this, like, like everything that progress is pointing towards. Mm -hmm. I just have certain thoughts and feelings about that based off of my own lived experiences and the way that I've, you know, overcome obstacles in my own life. Mm -hmm. uh, and I just feel that uh, it, the, these these personal struggles apply in a lot of ways to uh, humanity at large and, and the struggles that humanity is going through. And I feel like there's there's stages of there's just stages of more advanced insight. There's stages of more advanced like progression emotionally, psychologically, uh, what have you. Mm. Um, there's a lot of beauty that we're in the process of uncovering. I like what you said about advanced intelligence. Uh, I feel like we should call it advanced intelligence rather than artificial intelligence, but that goes against what I've been saying recently, which is that what we should co really call it is artificial knowledge, not artificial intelligence, uh, because intelligence implies something that it may or may not have, because I don't think we really know what intelligence is, but I don't know if we know what knowledge is. <laughs> uh, anyway, I, one thing I'm sure of is we don't know what consciousness is, um, but, mm. but, but mm. We, we know it. We may know what knowledge is. We may know what intelligence is. But I think it's not right to call it artificial intelligence until we know for sure that we know whether what intelligence is. What do you think about knowledge? Do you do you think that it's artificial intelligence or artificial knowledge? Yeah, uh, I think that's a lovely question. Mm. I'm thinking about verbs. I'm thinking about who is doing the knowing. <laughs> you know, um, and you can apply that question even even to humans, right? There's the whole like Buddhism, like non-self thing, which yeah. uh, at various points I've like tried. I've like squeezed really hard to be like, okay, I'm going to realize non-self. I'm going to realize yeah, yeah. that I'm my, this self that I believe exists. You know, everyone says it's empty of inherent existence. And I'm going to, I'm going to realize it right now. And, um, you know, I, so I, but I, I tend to live my days with the belief that I am Cody and, and, you know, have all these things like orbiting around that. Um, and it's pretty heavy, but, um, uh, where, whereas it could be light, it could be as light as, as yes. being, you know, infinite and boundless. Yes. Um, and uh you know i i i don't know but i i i tend to believe that there is a conscious experiencer and i, I tend to believe that there is not one when it comes to artificial intelligence mm, yes exactly. Um, yeah, yeah. whereas i i also flip to the pan side of the spectrum yep. I, I do i do play with that a little bit but it's but i i like to think that in in terms of my pan uh you know, an artificial intelligence is not, you know, is not knowing things in the way that you or I would say that we know things, mm. um, which is actually quite interesting yeah. because knowing is itself like it's a, I don't know if you've heard of like the self one versus self two distinction. I have not. Oh, there's this book called The Inner Game of Tennis. And nice. I, I picked it up because it was sitting outside someone's house. It's this uh, like moldy old book. And, um, but it's about self one versus self two. It's like, you know, if, if you like learn to play tennis very well, yeah. you know, there there's you, there's the ego you, which says, okay, you know, like swing, swing the racket and then yeah. there's self too, which you have no control over, which actually yeah. does the swinging of the racket yeah. in some particular kind of a way. All you can do is really, you know, guide them or coax them along. And, and, um, um, so in, in that way, you know, I think that knowing is kind of the self to process where, you know, you just, you just end up knowing things or you don't. Yes. And you don't have control over that. So it's almost separate from that's it's, knowing is this mechanistic process. And, uh, and, you know, the conscious experiencer just happens to be receiving that almost like a module. So there, there could be an argument. I don't know that like is knowing the process of just like having knowledge, like come to you as a conscious experiencer, or is like knowing the process of like, Oh, you could theoretically access it which would also depend on being a conscious experiencer i don't know i i would i would hesitate to say that an artificial intelligence could like do things that are like self 
that like depend on having a conscious experience. Mm. Um, this is a very interesting point. If you have anything more to say, please, please feel free. Otherwise I, I can respond to one specific thing you said. Yeah, go for it. So knowing versus knowing about that was the the thread that was really running through my head as you were talking, uh, particularly around the conscious experience or this thing that is on all the time, the self too, the, the thing that I can't really turn into an object of focus. Um, the self one, I can turn that into an object of focus. I can, I can, I can say, Oh, there's Stuart. There he is. He's, he's right there. He's doing that thing. Uh, but then it, it, as you're saying, who is, who is the, <clears throat> who is the entity doing the doing that thing is self too. And that thing is not an entity. It seems beyond the ability. It seems going back to the other part of the conversation, everything is connected it's part of the universe and the universe is in action and we're just one kind of separate thing that appears separate, but at one point we'll then go back uh, and, and be fused yeah. into the back into the hole. So that brings to mind the knowing versus knowing about, and I really like this because this gets right into LLMs uh, because LLMs have extracted everything humans know about <clears throat> everything that they've known about. But they can't know anything, in my opinion. And it sounds like probably your opinion uh -huh. as well. Uh -huh. they can't know anything. I know, I know this room. This room is in the process of knowing with me. I'm I know, I know you. Uh I, we haven't met in person yet, but I know you. Uh 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 maybe not at your essence. Maybe I don't know you well enough for your essence, but I I know who you are sitting in front of me. Um uh uh and I I know the self one. The self two is constantly being revealed to me, the self one, um, and uh, and and many times it can get quite intense. Uh, there is the bliss aspect you mentioned, and the the lightness and and everything like that. But there are other times where the self one comes back and tries to claw back at it, and and uh, and uh, and it's not a fun experience for me. Um, uh, but I'm creating the whole experience. Uh, we got we got deep deep philosophical very quickly, but the, this part on the LLM is really interesting about knowing about, and this is a really good distinction as I continue to go down this path. What do you think about the people who are who you know no offense to them, but who are um, uh, talking as if AI is conscious and wanting to give it rights as a conscious being, um, and these these types of threads? What do you think about them? <clears throat> Yeah, it's it's a good question. It was really interesting when I started to like increasingly encounter it as like like ChatGPT came out and it was like a fun nifty tool. Yeah, and, you know, at first there was like GPT three and that one like kind of sucked, and yeah. then uh, all of a sudden you know GPT three point five and then GPT four comes out, and all of a sudden some of my friends are saying, "Don't talk to it that way." Yeah, like it, yeah. it has feelings yeah. too, and then yeah. it was just, "Hey, whoa, wait a second, wait a second, wait a second, where did this?" Where did this, you know, in, in the process of like logical deduction, you know, where did we deduce that ChatGPT like had feelings or or any of that? I, I mean, I don't want to, you know, uh, diss them too hard, you know, in case the the future comes biting back at me and twenty years <laughs> yeah. from now, this is actually a very offensive very offensive thing for me to say or, um, or that it's or that it's actually conscious the other idea is that we're both wrong and that it is actually conscious which could be the truth and i think as long as but i don't I like that that then uh there's nothing then we're just wrong factually but the, yeah the point you meant that if it turns into a negative thing that society starts to penalize that would suck but in that future i'm not oh yeah no i i it. actually meant i mean i i don't think that that would be I, I don't see it becoming like swelling up too much unless we actually, unless what actually, I mean, cause there's no way here, here's the thing again of like, there's no way for me to like verify that you're conscious yes. except yes. through some like complicated process of like my own personal, like check, bo check yes. boxes, yeah. which is like just absurd. Yeah. Um, yeah. I don't know. I mean, I think we're we're in for an interesting time. I think it's it's actually, you know, occurring excruciatingly slowly right now. You know, I mean, I think when GPT-4 came out, all everything freaking cool. happened at once. It's like yep. it was just like 
product release, product release, product release. It was just wow. And um, and I mean, now we do have Sora, which is the AI, you know, video generator system, which is freaking spectacular, phenomenal, scary, all in one. I mean, I don't know. I, I, I expect to continue having complicated, you know, nuanced melanges of feelings about different AI products as they come out. And I look forward to them. I await them. And I think that ultimately they just like, you know, they're, I don't know, you might have an opinion that there's forbidden technologies or technologies that will like bring out the worst in us or like cause bad outcomes. But I feel, you know, that these technologies, they ultimately just get us faster to wherever we were already going. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I think, I guess I think about the underlying, underlying fundamental like nature of human beings and the essence mm -hmm. of human beings. And, you know, it just, it's, it's beautiful. And, and, you know, it's, it's, you can't extract it from the universe around us. Like we can't like the, the same way that you like, you know, someone c commits what we call a crime and then we, we put them in jail, we penalize them. We say, you, you did a bad thing. It's like, you gotta, you, like you, you fuck this up basically you're a criminal or whatever. I don't think humans can can be in that position about their species. I mean, we can we can do certain things, but we're we're natural. Like the the same way that like uh you know Charles Darwin called some things natural selection, you know, the universe selected things and then artificial selection. He made this distinction that there was humans breeding for particular traits. And I always found this odd because I saw humans as, you know, a natural being you know mm. sure we have like these yeah, these yeah, egos yeah. that are like quote unquote artificial but it's like that itself is kind of this illusory distinction like there's there's this this continuum where we're directly connected to the rest of the universe you know it just it flows in us through us like w like all of this like the room itself as well as me is just the universe universing and, <laughs> and it's just continually like doing this mm. at, at whatever you know resonance frequency it wants to and um well, shoot, I, I forget where I was going there, but um, yeah, I think that we're going in whatever direction we're going, and then you can speed that up or slow that down. And I think we already are whatever we we are, and and nothing we can do can can or will change that. And it's some kind of like hubris to think that we have the power to, I don't know, defy defy this thing that we are, and that's in a yeah. good way. Like yeah. the thing that we are is so expansive that we can't actually conceptualize it. Um, yeah. You know, we, we, we come from something that's that's spectacular and AI is just little bits and pieces of that spilling artistically out so that we can see it. And it's just I, I, I look forward to kind of what it what it uh, continues coming into. Beautiful. Uh, I loved what you said about universe is universing. Uh, and our and, and that the AI is just is a symptom. It's a byproduct of what the magic inside of human beings, which is quite magical. I don't think you, this was your point, but it brought up an interesting distinction uh, because human beings, while being natural, also created an abstract universe of concepts that allow us to create not only, you know, high-end electronic machines that are, you know, so out of what would be considered natural that they look very different. And they feel very different, and they have a very different aesthetic than that a that a, a that a mouse can't even conceptualize. Like it's just you know, and I imagine animals have like some beginnings of concepts, like like primates or something like that. I imagine that they have some proto concepts, um, but for the most part, there's a strong dividing line between humans and other animals, uh, and. So while we are natural, there is also something separate and uh, unique and and more magical about humans. What do you think? Do you agree? Do you disagree? There's something more magical about humans than animals, <clears throat> than other animals. So you have animals, and they're you know running around doing all the animal things. They're highly programmed. Not to say that humans aren't also highly programmed, but our programming is different and we can in some ways transcend our programming in ways that animals can't. Uh, what do you think about that? There's, I mean, what, what you were saying had to be thinking in a lot of ways. Like, I mean, it was, it was definitely clearing out some cobwebs, um, things I haven't thought about in a while uh, or at all. And I mean, I was thinking about humans and, and their, their creative force and 
there, there definitely is something uniquely special about humans. I mean, if mm. you think about uh, the strange loop, it's like you have mm. a camera pointing at like a TV screen and the mm. TV screen's the display displaying, you know, the output of the camera. Uh, uh, and so then you have this recursive loop of like things happening. And a lot of animals, I mean, you might have a dog that looks at its reflection sometimes. Yeah. And you have some some birds that display self-awareness. And so yeah. I think they yeah. can get into some funky head spaces. <laughs> but um, humans, you know, really have it going on in terms of like... Uh, I don't know humans humans create buildings we create art we draw portraits of ourselves we draw mc escher art like i don't know we, we we build computers like you said and but there's also this there's this yin to that so there's the yang of like oh humans did all this stuff we we really built that and, and no one else you know did that it's like we don't even know that. we don't even know if there's there's like other you know creatures and species like the, the unit the observable universe ends and and inside of that and beyond that as far as we can tell it's just freaking us and we were the first to invent and think yeah. of all this stuff yeah. but on the flip side of that there's a yin to creation where it's like something i don't know could only have been created if it already like existed in in some some mm, sort of sense like, yes yes I, like i I'm, I'm feeling like a very symbolically logical like very quantized version of the universe right now where mm -hmm. like um i don't know like like the act of creating something is just like allowing i don't know there, there's just like there's an there's a still a naturalness to that you know in, in the mm -hmm. same it's identical to the process of creation where you know a gecko gets gets created uh, and and designed sculpted through the universe yeah no it's it's it, I, I love what you said it's the Empire State had to the Empire State Building had to be formulated in the mind of the architect before it could come into reality. Mm -hmm. Like that, there's a logical connection between those two things. Without that architect, with that specific unique image in his mind, now where that image came from is a entirely different uh, story, uh, and where ideas come from in general is a is an open question that I still have never answered. You would say self two or something like that, and self two, interesting. I like that. That's yeah, interesting. Okay, so act of creating, I love it. The birds as funky headspaces. I love the idea of birds having hunky, funky headspaces. There's one particular uh, TikTok guy from Russia uh, who has a crow with him, and it's some of the best uh, YouTube or TikTok videos I've seen. And he just obviously displays the incredible intelligence of the crow. Like he has it do things that uh, what I would consider only humans be able to do. And it's this crow with this little tiny brain. Uh, you know, it's like, how did the brain figure out how to have that level of self-awareness and intelligence? I don't know. Um, and well, maybe I should go study that. Um, uh, I want to save the last like 15 minutes or so of building in public. Um, uh, I've last Friday, I had a uh, a very interesting experience where a friend of mine who runs a company, um, he wanted me to do a private podcast with him, uh, not for the sake of publishing that podcast, but for the sake of publishing the thoughts inside that podcast. And you mentioned that today we're getting into that territory of essentially like things you haven't thought about. And I'm really, I, I want to build this business. It's really fun. Uh, what do you think of this business? Do you think it's a good idea? Do you think it's a bad idea? That's a bad question. I shouldn't ask, do you think it's a good idea? I should ask like, like, what are your thoughts about this business? Um, uh, and let me color it out a bit more. The uh, Like a founder of a company, particularly if a founder of a company is going to start talking publicly more and needing to 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 sort of create a, a brand for lack of a better word, um, they need to be able to think on their feet and a podcast is actually one of the best ways to train that. Uh, but oftentimes when you're starting a company, there's things that you can talk about and there's things that you can't talk about. Previous to this conversation on Friday, I was only thinking about things that you could talk about. Um, what do you think about this business? If you were a, a angel investor or something like that, uh, what would your questions be about this business? Very cool. Um, yeah, I'll start with my overall like general um, thought, thoughts about that. Um, yeah, I mean, there, so there's AI tools coming out right now. I think um, I was an associate at Techstars and uh, one of my my cohort uh, founders, I was working on this thing called, I think it was called Grand Stage or 
I, I think it might have been a different one actually, but it was an AI tool that trains like salespeople, you know, mm-hmm. through mm-hmm. having these like conversations and, and that's actually like a pretty common use case of LLMs. It's like you're able to like have these conversations with someone on the other line. And so you're practicing your skills. And so if you convert that into a format where it's like you're speaking and then someone else is speaking, you know, it's like it's with minimal like corporate resources, uh, you know, you can build up those hours of kind of like training the, the speaking, you know, more or less. Yeah, that's a great idea. I want to hear the other ideas. So, too. yeah, go for it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but but, you know, y- your idea has something that's missing from that. I mean, obviously, having a human being, especially very high quality, like human being interactions that are like high bandwidth, you have a skilled, skilled person. I mean, like, if anything like that, that would the AI thing could just be practice for like practicing with you, for example. I think mm-hmm. I think a podcast is a beautiful format to extract ideas from people. I mean, like you know, you have a conversation with someone, and it's it's extended extended cognition all the way. Like you know, they're <laughs> they're poking and probing you, and then you're like in this like roller coaster journey of like going through the things that you know, and and yeah, like speaking on your feet. I think it's it's a great way to get someone talking and i think it's um um it's wonderful practice but you were saying something about like building like some kind of like knowledge base out of the information well, no, uh, so kind well kind of that's that's going to be something that he does um uh with the knowledge that i'm that we're uncovering and stuff like that but I may help him with that mm-hmm. but i'm but i'm i'm uh and actually did that at my previous job uh, which is why I got interested in IdeaFlow is because basically I was, uh, they hired me as the director of knowledge management. Um, and uh, not only as the director of knowledge management for a high growth company that was going through major hyper growth, but also starting my own business unit that was supposed to turn the cost center of knowledge management into a revenue center by um, by by selling a solution for knowledge management, both to the parent company that I was associated with and also other companies. And in that process, uh, there's something there as well in terms of a knowledge knowledge base uh, and applied AI to the knowledge base. Um, And uh, and there's something interesting there as well. Um, But uh, yeah, what do you think of that? Yeah. um, I mean, that's pretty cool. I'd definitely be curious to like know a bit more about the solution that you came up with if it's not proprietary. Um, IdeaFlow definitely strives to do that as well. So we're yes. we're in the kind of the nascent stages of, you know, you can record a conversation and then click on, on the parts of the AI button and then it extracts like the the entities and the relationships between them. And so we're uh, in the middle of a kind of like rapidly, um, you know, uh, prototyping to 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 work with that and expand that. Um, but so we, yeah, we have like a rudimentary kind of like automatically build your knowledge base for you, um, which I see definitely as the future of like. Having especially these kinds of conversations, like you know, you just want to be able to take notes as sort of a fidget spinner, right? Whatever you yep. need to, or just remembering what you're about to say as well is very handy. Uh, but then, like, pass the baton really to an artificial intelligence, which is going to, you know, like really build the structured knowledge base of the situation. And then all of a sudden, you know, you're like, what we just did, we just excavated each other's like brain, yeah. right? And then the yeah. AI is like, okay, here's like the union of you two as as a singular entity and like what your shared knowledge base kind of like looks like and they say that in a relationship you know there's really three people there there's you the other person and then like the combination of you two and so (laughs) the an ai tool could actually help us see that almost as if it were a more physicalized uh thing yeah that's brilliant it reminds me of knowledge graphs uh a previous guest talked about knowledge graphs and actually, it was related to the solution that I was trying to trying to build, which we never built. So I never actually built the thing. Um, uh, we were got we got close to it, but um, and he, he this previous podcast guest of mine, he had found me on Twitter, and he told me that knowledge graphs would solve that that problem that we were focusing on. Uh, uh, do you happen to know what a knowledge graph is? Because I still don't know what a knowledge graph is. What is it? Yeah. Well, I mean. <clears throat> You know, it's it's uh, little bits and pieces of knowledge, and you link them together. Uh, an example knowledge graph that I really love. Uh, IdeaFlow has kind of this this like beta uh, in, internal product, and it's called uh, IdeaPad, and it's really just it's just a graph, but it's a graph of like basically, you know, it, it's kind of the digital version of like uh, uh, when Jacob was like an innovation consultant, he would do like a sticky notes, and then he'd like you know, put a push pin in them and like connect them with string. Yeah, That's yeah. a knowledge graph. 
Yeah. Okay. Uh, got it. Interesting. So is it a mind map? Is a mind map the same thing as a knowledge graph? Well, I, I would suppose so. I haven't looked too much into the specifics of the terminology. And and I would actually like to share that my favorite like mind map basically, or, or knowledge graph, the only knowledge graph that I really have cared about is like my knowledge graph of like different albums. Um, <laughs> Great so, music. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Like connecting them together and like describing the relationship between the albums is so important to me. And like, uh -huh. that's the number one way where like, if I opened up my iPod, I'd actually want to see, you know, some some way of like navigating that graph. You know, that's how I'd want to listen to music. That's also how I would choose to like recommend music to my friends. It's like knowing that they like one of those yeah. albums, I would want them to try, kind of traverse the paths around that graph. What do you think is going to happen to the music industry, particularly so Spotify has started to get really good in terms of their recommendations, like the recommendation engine wasn't that great. Now it's good. And it probably has something to do with LLMs or something like that or some other AI algorithm. Um, there's a problem with Spotify, which is that they're now paying new artists nothing, almost nothing. So they 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 basically they pay the big artists a whole bunch of money that top 0.1% whole bunch of money for for all the streams and stuff like that because that represents most of their their users and their business model requires that uh, but they're totally ignoring a lot of the new music and so I think there's going to be a a where where I think most new artists will probably not go on Spotify until they get big somehow else and so I think it's opening up an opportunity to create a business uh, somehow finding a, and with the AI generated music, which is going to make music way easier to make, um, uh, the there's going to be people who a lot of new music that will come out that will be hidden from Spotify. Do you think that that's an accurate representation of the of the music industry? Uh, if not, what do you think? Yeah, I, again, like a lot of a lot of thoughts there. Um, I mean, these days you have a lot of like, I mean, my my stuff comes out on SoundCloud. So there's this, so I have a lot of thoughts about this. You opened up yeah. Pandora's box here because I'm a, a computer music concentration. <laughs> I think I've thought like a lot of my technology thoughts, they go right to music. Like I fucking, I, I just can't stop, uh, you know, thinking about this. And and unfortunately the pace of innovation has been way slower than the rate that like I, I wow. think of like things that I want to see in the world. Yeah. So again, with these like continuums, there's no like separation between like Spotify music and then like, I, I don't know, like some, some, you know, throat singer in whatever country yeah. people have throat yeah. singers and he, he does, he does his tune that he always does. But you know, this time, you know, it's, it's different. I don't know, like, you know, live performances, yeah, you have God. the, the birth. Yeah music being born in a single moment in, in like band practice. And it's like, those are right now, those are, those are demos and they get released as on the B sides of the album is the way that we packaged it up. But these packages, they're, they're artificial. They're actually created by an industry that is like on, on a collision course with like, like digital abundance. What is music? <laughs> yeah. With musical abundance. I don't know. I mean, it, it's the industry itself is exploitative towards artists yeah. and, uh, you know, yeah. all, all the big artists, when they get big, they fight against its existence. But like that structure actually helps us, you know, appreciate and enjoy music. And um, mm. and as it increases know, it's, the accessibility, as it definitely increased the accessibility of music and art. I mean, especially with the rise of streaming. I mean, you know, you had people like paying for CDs and stuff. And now, you know, everything's on YouTube, everything's on Spotify. But um yeah, there, there, there's so many things I want to see in the music space, but it's also like, what exactly is music? <laughs> is such a weird question. Like, like here's the thing, I, I love to blame capitalism. I love to like really hate on it, but also, capitalism has helped us so much. Like the fact that we have this stable economic structure is like such a wonderful thing. And then for music, I might like to you know dislike. Uh, this industry and what it's done but there's a beauty in the way that it evolved this way and it created this like you know if music is this fundamental primordial thing i'll be really curious to see what the next forms that it takes are but it's also like i'm, I'm grateful that it was uh you know stable in its current shape where i can kind of box it up and say oh this is my this is a single album it has a start and an end all the songs always go the same way and they always go in the same order Unless I want to, you know, remix them and make them into a remix tape, and that's a whole separate thing. 
Um, it's beautiful. Yeah, <laughs> there's a lot we could go into there. What exactly is music is a great question. Um, and it goes to, back to why people take notes and also the conversation on art. Um, there is this this thing that I'm now losing. I uh, didn't get the best sleep last night. So actually, yeah, let's, same boat. Let's, yeah, let's, uh, uh, let's call it a an interview. Uh, I appreciate you so much for taking the time. Uh, really good questions. We came up with a lot of good questions here. Uh, how can people find out more about you and your work? Yeah, well, shoot, I used to have a website. Um, <laughs> uh, how can they find out more about me and my work? I will say TBD. Yeah, uh, shoot, they, they can go on my LinkedIn. And uh, one, one day I'll have URLs there that are, you know, uh, professional life approved. Cool. Thank you, Cody. Thanks, Stuart. Great to be here.